Good evening and welcome to this regular meeting of the Council of the Municipality of North Perth. Our meeting date is Monday, March 20th, 2023. I'm Mayor Todd Kasenberg and I'll call this meeting to order. I ask the clerk to note our starting time for the minutes, 7.02 p.m. A warm welcome is extended to councillors, staff and delegations who will participate in this meeting regardless of being physically in attendance in the council chamber in Listowel or being connected through web technologies. We begin tonight's meeting with the playing of O Canada. Those in chambers, as able, are invited to stand. land of the Anishinaabe peoples. We wish to recognize a long history of Indigenous peoples in Canada and show our respect to them today. We recognize their stewardship of the land. May we all live with respect on this land and live in peace and friendship. Tonight's meeting is being streamed live on the Municipality of North Perth YouTube channel and will be available there after this meeting as an archived video. To those viewing this meeting via the YouTube channel, a warm welcome. To those present in the gallery today by attending a public meeting of the Council, you are consenting to your image, voice and comments being recorded. Anyone who is invited to speak will be recorded and their voice, image and comments will form part of the live stream. The chair and or the clerk have the discretion and authority at any time to direct the termination or interruption of live streaming. Such direction will only be given in exceptional circumstances when deemed relevant. Circumstances may include instances where the content of debate is considered misleading, defamatory, or potentially inappropriate to be published. Attendees are advised that they may be subject to legal action if their actions result in inappropriate and or unacceptable behavior and or comments. Thank you. At this time, I invite your decorum over the course of the coming meeting. Looks like we're all here. Councillor Anstead, I believe, is connected remotely, and so we welcome him as well. And uh, now that means we can move on to item 2.1 of our agenda pertaining to pecuniary interest. 
For the benefit of those unfamiliar with our council practices, provincial legislation requires councillors with a potential pecuniary or financial interest in any item at the council table to declare this interest and to remove her or himself from discussions and voting on the item. In accordance with recommended protocol at this time, I invite all councillors who perceive a pecuniary interest, including those who have declared in writing already, to verbally advise the chair in public session and to submit documentation to this effect in writing to the clerk. Councillors are further reminded that should a potential conflict arise during the meeting, they may so declare an act at any point in the meeting. And I have heard ahead of time today from Councillor Andreessen, so let me uh, make a few adjustments here and we'll recognize her on the floor. Thanks. Can I just ask you to check your microphone? I didn't. I was having a hard time hearing that. I don't know whether it's green. All right. We'll assume that it's uh, working properly. Uh, thank you. Uh, anyone else wishing to declare pecuniary interests at this hour? All right. I'm not seeing any. So uh, all participants are invited to speak when called upon by yours truly, serving as chair. Those participating remotely who wish to speak may draw the attention of the clerk through our conferencing technologies chat function. Remote participants are asked to generally maintain a mute state in the web conference until I recognize your right to the floor. If when I do so recognize I don't hear you because you are muted or are having some technical difficulty, I will advise. Let us now focus on the people's business. I invite those in the chamber to silence and put away their phones. Regarding item 2.2 of our agenda, I have a motion before me for the adoption of the agenda for tonight's meeting. It reads simply as follows, that the agenda for tonight's meeting be approved. Can I call for mover on this? Councillor Blazek and Councillor Duncan will be our second. Thank you. Any discussion or debate? Seeing none, let's have that vote. And I will have to record mine manually because apparently mine didn't come up. And with that, the motion carries. <clears throat> Let me just get myself reset here. and Hopefully that solves that problem. All right. Uh, let's move forward then to item three on our agenda, the so-called consent agenda. Consent items are placed on our agenda because they are believed to be non-contentious, yet they may warrant council's recognition and or action. Grouping them expedites our business. However, any councillor wishing to extract an item from the consent agenda for discussion, debate, and or individual action may do so. We have 12 items on the consent agenda for our meeting tonight, including the minutes of our last regular council meeting. Councillors, anything to extract here or any corrections to the minutes? I'm not seeing any indication of that, so let's turn to a resolution for our consideration as follows. That consent items 3.1 to 3.12 be received for information and the minutes of the March 13th, 2023 regular council meeting be adopted. Can I call for a mover on this? Thank you, Councillor Nordham and Councillor Richardson will be our seconder. Uh, any discussion or debate? Seeing none, let's have that vote. And that is carried, thank you. Uh, let's move then to item number four on our agenda. We have no public meetings scheduled for this evening's meeting, but we do have two delegations this evening, both brought to us from the staff of the County of Perth. For item 4.1, we have as a delegate, Mr. Sean McCoy, who serves as legislative coordinator and deputy clerk for the County of Perth. Mr. McCoy is the county's expert on its forestry program and initiatives and will present to us on that subject matter tonight. For Council's benefit, this presentation should be considered part of this Council's training platform. Uh, with that, then, we turn the floor over to Mr. McCoy. Welcome, Mr. McCoy. Uh, 
Thank you, Mayor Kaysenberg. I appreciate the warm welcome. And to you and uh, through you to Council, I'd like to thank you again for the opportunity to present today. I'm sorry if I'm speaking a little disjointedly. I'm getting some verbal feedback. There we go. I had some audio feedback through my ear, but that seems to have corrected itself. You know, apologies for that. Okay. If uh, I may, I have a... Um, slide deck to share here. Now you may f bear with me here. I'm pretty new to this platform. I think I've done it. Can everybody see my, my slide deck? Uh, not yet. Oh, hmm. there we go. Okay. Got the layer. Oh. Figured out, uh, Mr. McCoy, so we're ready. Okay, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Okay, so today I am going to provide a brief overview of the county's forestry program. Uh, we'll cover some background information, including legislation, some history of the bylaw and the requisite delegated authority from the lower tier municipalities uh, to uh, regulate the injury and destruction of trees in woodlots under one hectare. Uh, more on that later as well as some quick information about uh, sort of the history of our ash tree amendments, uh, the notice of intent or NOI process, as well as uh, what we do for reporting. Uh, we'll touch a bit on the tree grant program, which is uh, sort of not part of the forestry program, uh, more part of our grant program, but it is uh, thematically uh, germane to the presentation. And then uh, we'll touch on uh, weed inspection as well. So much of our program relates to regulating the destruction or injury of trees in the county. Tree canopy accounts for only about 9% of uh, the overall county land area, which is well under our neighbors. Uh, for example, in Huron County, uh, they have about 16% coverage. So the goal of the program is to promote responsible forestry practices and to improve county forest coverage while also supporting our woodlots and woodlands for the benefit of our ecosystems as well as for the recreational and aesthetic enjoyment for the members of our community and uh, visitors to our region. So the authority for municipalities to regulate the injury and destruction of trees is found under section 135 of the Municipal Act. Upper tiers have the authority uh, under the section over woodlands of one hectare or larger as defined in the Forestry Act. So that definition of a woodland comes from the Forestry Act and is referenced in section 135 of the Municipal Act. And this woodland definition includes specific minim minimum density levels uh, for trees of various sizes and is reflected in the definitions included in our bylaw. Uh, local municipalities, or in our case, uh, the lower tier municipalities, don't have any defined area limiting their authority. So under the Municipal Act, a lower tier municipality can uh, regulate uh, any tree. Uh, however, in our bylaw, the scope of authority has been limited to trees within the woodlot, uh, within woodlots, uh, which are wooded areas uh, with a minimum specified density uh, of 0.2 hectares to that one hectare limit where the uh, authority would be uh, sort of ceded to the upper tier. Uh, so the authority granted in the Municipal Act also extends to enforcing conditions on harvesting trees, uh, including permitting, and more on that as we go through. So Perth County has been regulating the destruction or injury of trees uh, in some form by bylaw since 1947. And this bylaw has been updated over the years. And most the most current version is bylaw number 3836-2021. And authority for the county to enforce the injury and destruction of trees in woodlots under one hectare pursuant to the bylaw has been delegated from each of the lower tiers. And uh, those corresponding bylaws are listed here. Right now, what I'd like to do is just highlight uh, a few sections of the bylaw. Uh, first is uh, section two, which is a general prohibition to the destruction and injury of any tree in a woodland or woodlot, uh, and those are defined in the bylaws, those woodlands and woodlots. 
Uh, there are two exceptions to this under Section 3. One is the destruction or injury of trees pursuant to a silvicultural prescription prepared by a professional forester according to good forestry practice. And the other is destruction or injury of trees pursuant to the diameter and circumference listed uh, per species in the Schedule A of the bylaw. Um, and this part also rolls into our ash tree amendment, which allows for reduced diameter and circumference limits uh, for ash species listed in Schedule A. Um, so uh, this was this amendment was established to facilitate more uh, efficient removal of ash trees impacted by the emerald ash borer. Section five lists a number of exemptions uh, from the bylaw, many of which are mandatory under that section 135 of the Municipal Act. And these uh, are specific circumstances where the bylaw, uh, the prohibition in the bylaw doesn't apply. And of course, there's the aforementioned uh, Schedule A, along with uh, a number of details related to work orders, offenses, and penalties, et cetera. So as I touched on briefly in the previous slide, uh, the bylaw has been amended twice to facilitate a more streamlined approach to removing ash trees, which may be impacted by emerald ash borer. The first was a temporary amendment in December of 2019, which reduced the diameter and circumference limits uh, for ash trees listed in Schedule A to zero centimeters. And this expired in September of 2022 and was replaced with a reduced diameter and circumference limit uh, to help preserve uh, ash borer resistant seedlings and saplings, which don't really provide sufficient sustenance to support uh, full blown ash borer infestations. And so those limits are listed here. The diameter limit for ash trees in Schedule A uh, are five centimeters diameter and circumference limits of uh, 16 centimeters. So this is the notice of intent. The Notice of Intent, or NOI, is the primary tool we use for enforcement of the bylaw. Uh, every harvesting project in a woodland or woodlot needs to have a corresponding notice submitted to the county, and the process for this is detailed in Section 6 of the bylaw. To summarize, though, depending um, on the method of harvest, notices need to be submitted to the county uh, within a certain time before the project commences. If you're using a silvicultural prescription, we require a minimum of 20 days to a maximum of 180 days. And if you're uh, pr pr proceeding with a project uh, pursuant to the diameter circumference limits, uh, then there's a five day, or sorry, rather seven business day minimum, and uh, again, a maximum of 180 days notice. Receipted copy is then returned to the contractor and the materials submitted are also forwarded to our weed and tree inspector uh, who will coordinate the inspection process with the contractor and or the landowner. It's important to emphasize, I think, that the notice of intent is not a permit per se. So we simply require notice so that inspections can be conducted to make sure that contractors and landowners are carrying out their project pursuant to the requirements under the bylaw. So there's no fees for submitting a notice of intent. Uh, and as a result, uh, we have essentially a very cost and time effective process for landowners and contractors uh, and subsequently has a high prevalence of compliance. So it, it works pretty well. Forestry program reporting is carried out a number of ways. Um, there are monthly tree inspector reports that are provided to county council and circulated to lower tiers for information. In uh, the first quarter, staff prepare an annual administration report that provides statistics regarding NOI submissions and other activities carried out during the previous year. And also in Q1, there's a, an annual weed inspectors report. And of course, there are ad hoc reports to facilitate updates uh, amendments and other items of interest related to the forestry program that may uh, pop up from time to time. The county also has a tree grant as part of its cultivating opportunity grant program. Uh, as I said before, this isn't strictly related to the forestry program, but it is tree related. Um, so this consists right now of a $25,000 budget annually to be distributed to uh, each of the lower tiers based on weighted assessment. And those municipalities can then use uh, the funds as they see fit 
uh, to plant new trees. And uh, depending on the lower tier, this is either done uh, directly or through uh, a number of different uh, grant or subsidy programs. And starting this year, uh, the county is requiring some basic statistical reporting for program evaluation purposes. And this reporting was developed using information received from each of the lower tiers last year during the development of the, the new grant program. So it's information that's basically being uh, already collected. Uh, we just want to be able to share it at the county level to showcase all of the great work the money is being put towards. Um, so, yeah, we'll be we'll be proceeding with that for the first time this year. The other hat worn by our tree inspector is for weed inspection, and so this relates to enforcement uh, under the Weed Control Act and applies to the 25 provincially designated uh, weeds as well as to locally designated weeds. And enforcement is complaint driven uh, and the inspector does work with landowners to develop eradication strategies and issues work orders when necessary. If you are interested in more information, we do have a pretty handy web page on the county's website. So there's all sorts of really great information about the program on here, including uh, links to the bylaw and the notice of intent uh, form, as well as the process for submitting that form, uh, and as well as anything you'd want to know about noxious weeds and invasive species in the area. And we also have a really great video uh, of an information session we held in December of 2021, which includes an overview of the bylaw, pretty similar to what I provide uh, here tonight, um, as well as presentations from our weed and tree inspector, Marvin Smith, and our, our prosecutor, uh, Daryl Hauerlich. Uh, if you do have any questions about the program in general, you can feel free to contact us at the Legislative Services Division. However, if you do have site-specific questions about a particular woodland or woodlot or just need clarification on how the bylaw may or may not apply to your property, I would recommend that you contact our weed and tree inspector Marvin Smith directly and his contact information is here as well as on our website at this at the page in this link. Uh, and you can also find it pretty easily I find just through a simple Google search of Perth County Forestry Program. And that's everything I wanted to cover today in the program. This is my contact information here. Uh, I'm, I'm open to any questions, but if you think of any later, um, you can email me or give me a call and I'll be happy to, to discuss them with you. I'm going to attempt to stop my share now. I don't know if that was successful or not. We see you well at this point, Mr. McCoy. You're, you're full screen for us at this point. Okay, very good. So um, let's turn to council here. Any questions or comments for Mr. McCoy on, on this information? Anything else that you want to know? Okay, Councillor Ruffalo. Thanks very much, uh, Mayor Todd and Council. Uh, greetings. Uh, Sean, thanks very much for uh, your report. One item you didn't specifically touch on is uh, compliance. Uh, are there a, uh, a number of uh, matters that go before the court in terms of uh, non-compliance with the uh, forest conservation bylaw? But just in terms of uh, incidents of non-compliance? Yes, thank you. Um, th there are, but uh, not not too many, to be honest. Uh, it's a uh, each year is a little bit different, um, but it's it's not too common, to be honest. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate um, If you wanted some more specific numbers, I could be I'd be happy to get back to you with those, but uh, I don't have those numbers in front of me right now. Uh, I appreciate that through you, uh, Mayor Todd. Thanks very much, uh, Sean. I think uh, your comment that uh, the uh, notice of intent program is uh, uh, well received, I think, is uh, shows that uh, the program has been around for quite some time, and that. Uh, uh, the majority of uh, people uh, comply, and uh, that makes for uh, good regulation and good uh, good processes going forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Rothwell. Uh, Councillor Nordham, next. Mm -hmm. Let me just find your microphone. There we go. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thanks for your report, Sean. Uh, just curious, what um, what's a silly cultural prescription? A silvicultural prescription, um, that's essentially like a site-specific 
forestry management plan. So a registered forester would attend the property and write up um, basically what trees would be good for harvesting, what trees should stay, and it's all taken in um, the the site itself is taken into consideration. All the all the nuances of that particular area. So so like I said, it's very site specific, and a registered forester would go to the property and determine which trees would be good for harvesting and which trees would be best to uh, maintain for future growing stock. Thank you. Anyone else with questions or comments? Uh, Councillor Rothwell, one more. Yeah, thanks very much, uh, Mayor Todd. And further uh, from Sean, your comment about uh, the tree grant, uh, perhaps uh, we'll get a report from our staff uh, through you, perhaps our <coughs> CEO will provide that in terms of our municipality, uh, what uh, our plans are within uh, to utilize our, our uh, proportion of those funds, uh, annual funds if there is some sort of uh, specific program that we have. So we'll look forward to seeing that at some time, I'm sure. Thank you. Just looking at CAO Snell, uh, is that the, the usual process? You're at number 13, right? Yeah. Thank you for the question, Council Rothwell. And good evening, Council. Uh, as many of you recall, North Perth did run a program where we actually provided trees to the community. Um, one of the problems we were having with that program was um, determining if all the trees we gave out were well looked after and maintained. And, and so we've since changed our um, plans with our trees. And so now all the trees, that tree money is actually being um, directly um, used to offset our tree planting program within the municipality, whether that be tree planting at the wastewater treatment plant that's been ongoing for several years or Memorial Park or even along the roadsides. So it's been going directly into our own tree planting operations and we can provide a, a, a summary of what we've done for tree planting in North Perth at some time in the future with no problem. Thank you, CAO Snell. Anyone else with questions or comments uh, for Mr. McCoy? All right. Uh, Mr. McCoy, thanks so much for being with us tonight. I know these aren't necessarily your usual work hours, but we're glad to have your presence at our council meeting tonight. Appreciate it. Thank you very much, Mayor. All right. Uh, next up then uh, is item 4.2, and I'm pleased to welcome, uh, again, employees from the county. I'm not sure whether, and I'll look at the clerk here, is, is Mr. Sager joining us or is it, okay. So uh, we are expecting then uh, two employees from the county, uh, Mr. Tyler Sager, who is the clerk for the County of Perth, and Ms. Rachel Cannon, who is legislative assistant in the county clerk's group. They are here to give us something of an overview of the county's accessibility efforts and further to present the next accessibility plan for the County of Perth, with a request that the plan, with the request for plan approval by this council. Uh, Mr. Sager and Ms. Cannon, welcome. Whoever is to speak first has the floor. Perfect. Good morning, uh, Mayor Kaysenberg. Good, good, good morning. Good morning. Good evening. Jeez. Clerk yeah, Sager, do you really get up this right? late? I, I, <laughs> I tell you, I tell you, I apologize. So uh, good evening, uh, Mayor Kaysenberg and uh, through you to council. Um, I'm going to have Rachel probably put on her camera and uh, and lead the presentation. Before you is the multi-year accessibility plan. And so this is a requirement uh, that we bring forward and uh, we'll be looking at 2023 to 2027. So I will hand the floor over to Rachel to do the presentation. Uh, she's done a lot of the work with the uh, municipal staff to to put this presentation together as well as the accessibility plan. So uh, Rachel, if you're available, um, also, good morning or good evening. <laughs> uh, through you, Mayor Kaysenberg and Council, thanks for having us. Um, just bear with me. I am going to just try and share mine as well. Perfect. Can we see that? 
right now we're just looking at the folders, Rachel. So you might have to just change the screen. Apologies. Um, here it is. You're looking at the presentation now? Just waiting for it to load up. Oh, it stopped sharing. Okay, um, I think our clerk has a copy of this and might bring it up for you. So uh, just hang on for her efforts. Sure, I appreciate that. Okay, we are seeing it um, transmitted at this point. I assume that's coming from our local source, Ms. Klein? Yeah, okay. So it's, it's available to you. If you just indicate when you want a slide change, we'll be happy to oblige. Great, thank you so much. Thanks, Lindsay. Um, so as Tyler stated, my name is Rachel Cannon. Um, I'm the Legislative Services Assistant at Perth County. Um, also, as Tyler said, we're here today to present the Perth County Joint Accessibility Plan, um, and that will span for the years 2023 to 2027. So, as you know, the Accessibility Plan is in its draft form before you, along with a formal report. Um, today, we're just going to go through some high-level points in relation to the Accessibility Plan and do our best to spotlight some of the great pieces and new strategies that we employed as we drafted it um, over the course of the last year. Perfect, next slide. Great. <laughs> uh, this slide is just a quick roadmap of where we're going to be going tonight. Um, just gives you sort of an idea of, oh, I lost the presentation. Yeah. Is it still up? We're, we're not seeing it in the council chamber at the moment either. Um, hang on. <laughs> Perfect. Back in business. Um, so again, this slide is just a general roadmap. Um, so next slide. Perfect. Um, so this is just going to provide you some context about um, the accessibility plan. So it is a requirement through the province of Ontario and the AODA legislation. Um, you can read all the legislation, but essentially we have to have an accessibility plan at the county level and it has to be updated at least once every five years. So this is that update. Next slide. Awesome, so what is the Perth County Joint Accessibility Plan? Um, the Joint Accessibility Plan spans across all areas of Perth County, and it's a really collaborative effort between the lower tiers and the upper tier to create the document. The information reflected in this accessibility plan is a collation of information on behalf of managers at the county level, and lower tier departments, um, which was graciously collected uh, at North Perth by your clerk, Lindsay Klein. Um, altogether, this plan reflects our commitment and incorporates all of our intentions at the municipal level to continue to meet our obligations under the AODA. Next slide. Awesome. Um, so this is just a quick overview of the accessibility program at Perth County. Um, so staff at the upper tier manage an overarching accessibility program. Of course, this is in addition to responsibilities held at the lower tier as well with regard to things like the building code and employment training requirements uh, with regard to accessibility. 
At the county level, um, we handle things like policies, procedures, and systems that relate to accessibility. Um, we ensure compliant and accessible services and facilities across the county. We're a point of contact for accessibility concerns or inquiries um, that clerks or other departments might need assistance with. We also manage the Joint Accessibility Advisory Committee, which is uh, mandated as well through provincial legislation. And finally, our staff provide training uh, and resources as needed. Um, great example of this is some of Sean McCoy's quarterly trainings. Next slide. Perfect. Uh, getting into the actual accessibility plan here. So we're just going to highlight sort of five really big ideas and things that we saw running through um, in various trends and threads through the whole plan. So with the entire plan for you, we don't want to go into too much depth. Um, but some of the highlights that we've noticed are a communi um, communication, so having a focus on streamlined communications through the county and its accessibility programs. We're also looking at education in the next five years, so continuing commitment um, to our internal and external education to support community members and businesses across the county. We're also looking at prioritizing diversity and inclusion. Um, and this accessibility plan is really a piece of that for the county. So making sure that this ties in with that as well. Um, we're taking an age-friendly lens with regard to accessibility. So making sure that our initiatives are um, supporting the aging population of Perth County. And finally, we're looking at maintaining our commitment to um, continue to be a leader in accessibility across the community and the county. Next slide. Perfect, so we really wanted to highlight this piece in the plan. Um, there are a couple pages dedicated to this in the accessibility plan, but it was our public engagement strategy. Um, it's a really exciting piece that we had this year and we were able to implement this with the help of our communications officer, Sarah Franklin. Um, again, we won't go too in depth with regard to the data tonight, but um, we'll just let you know what we did do from a broad perspective and then go into a couple of um, the demographics and an answer. So firstly, uh, what we did was our strategy was a 24 question digital survey that varied between long and short answer questions. That survey ran for approximately one month um, with the help of the lower tier clerks and um, our upper tier communications officer. We promoted that on various channels and we also promoted it to our JAC and asked them to share with their network as well. Next slide. Um, in terms of demographics, this was the response that we got. So we had 22 respondents, um, 20 Perth County residents and two out of county. I will just note the respondents that were out of county um, did, did reflect that either they worked in the county or they were interested in moving to the county. So they still had a vested interest in the um, accessibility and inclusivity of our community. Um, this is sort of how all of the respondents shook out in terms of the lower tiers. Um, next slide. Perfect. We were really happy with this. We got a great mix of respondents who identified as living with a disability and ones who identified as not living with a disability. Um, and then we had a few who preferred not to answer. So we thought that was great to highlight. Next slide. Finally, we just wanted to make note, this was sort of our general question right off the hop. It was, do you feel Perth County is an inclusive place for those who are living with disabilities? The majority of the answers here were positive, which is really great and a really great sign that the accessibility initiatives and programs that we're running are effective for community members. Next slide. Awesome, we're gonna move a little bit into um, a little bit finer detail, but again, this isn't focused on any one specific municipality. We've pulled out some of the accomplishment trends over the last five years from our previous accessibility plan. Um, so we're gonna highlight some of those. First, we've seen some great progress with regard to accessibility of meetings and court services using various technology and process upgrades. We've also seen a trend um, and many municipalities reported that they continue to meet the employment standards. Um, at all levels of the municipality through staff training and supports. Of course, with the rollout of our PC Connect service, um, we had a bit of accessibility there as we were making sure that it aligned with the transportation standards. And finally, um, we noted that all municipalities reported updating 
various public spaces through renovations or upgrades. Um, and these are reflected in things like our wayfinding system at the courthouse, tactile walking surfaces that have been installed throughout the community or power door installations. Next slide. Awesome, and then similarly, we've pulled out some trends for the next five years. So these are things that um, either the lower tiers or upper tiers have reported as being a priority when it comes to accessibility. Um, first, we noticed, of course, everybody continuing to put a prioritization on the remediation of website content to meet that WCAG 2.0 standard from the province. We've also noticed quite a few municipalities saying that they're looking into various digital tools like cloud permit or other things to put on their website to enhance customer service and accessibility digitally. Uh, third, we're looking at municipalities continuing to improve wayfinding and retrofit older municipal buildings for better accessibility. Um, you'll see that reflected in initiatives like the courthouse elevator. And finally, uh, continued prioritization of the county's accessibility program um, to increase overall knowledge for municipal staff across the community. Next slide. Perfect. Um, you will note that we do have a continued annual update process. So this is just to let you know, um, the annual update is also a legislative requirement as well. And Sean McCoy is generally the one who does that. So I just wanted to let you know that you will continue to receive that annual update on a yearly basis um, in a similar roadshow fashion. Uh, and that the next steps with this report will be that we'll continue our roadshow at all the lower tiers and then present it at County Council. So to a couple of you as well. Um, and where it will be approved and published on the Perth County website. Next slide. Awesome. So thank you again to everyone who contributed to the drafting process. It was a lengthy process and required loads of staff time and engagement. Um, this effort was totally collaborative and we're very proud to bring this document forward as a plan um, on behalf of the Perth County community. So with the report, the plan, and the presentation before you, does anybody have any questions for Tyler or I tonight? All right. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Cannon and Mr. Sager. Uh, let's turn to Council and see if there are questions or comments on uh, what was presented and what was available in our meeting package. Let me ask the first question. Um, perhaps you can sort of give us a brief overview of the work of the Joint Accessibility Advisory Committee, how it's constituted, what kind of things it does. Excellent. So I'll take that. Uh, so it doesn't matter if it's morning, afternoon, or evening. Uh, we're always available for questions. But uh, the Joint Accessibility Advisory Committee has done a lot of great work within uh, Perth County in general. So they meet uh, once a month to go through any kind of site plans um, that's usually done on an ad hoc basis for subcommittees. And so we, we put together a subcommittee to review site plans as well as any other initiatives that come forward. So this might be something within North Perth that is recognized by uh, the municipal staff that say, hey, we want individuals with lived experience to maybe comment. And so the Joint Accessibility Advisory Committee is happy to do that. Um, they also do other work within um, New Horizons grant. We brought this forward through through the county initiative, brought it through the Joint Accessibility Advisory Committee, and this was to provide age friendly initiatives and uh, training opportunities for businesses as we moved through COVID uh, to ensure that their spaces, their businesses, were accessible. So, the committee is available as a resource. We want to make sure that everybody is aware of that. Uh, we are actually looking, and we have a report coming forward to the uh, the committee on the twenty eighth, I believe it is. Uh, with respect to uh, North Perth, the Listful Home Show, and uh, getting them organized uh, there. So hopefully we can get them there. And if you have any further questions and want to ask any members directly, they'll, they'll hopefully be at the Home Show. Thank you for that. Uh, colleagues, any other questions or comments? Okay. Did anyone want to focus on anything that they saw in the report that they'd like to uh, have um, looked at more carefully or... Edited, revised, Councillor Rothwell. Thanks very much, uh, Mayor Todd, and thank you, uh, Rachel and Tyler, for the presentation. Uh, the Mayor's comment about the Joint Accessory Advisory Committee and, and uh, Tyler, your response to dealing with site plans. Uh, the province has changed uh, some of the requirements regarding uh, the municipality's uh, ability to require site plan agreements. 
uh, we're going to see less of them, uh, especially on the residential side. So does this, will this impact uh, uh, the ability of the uh, Joint Accessibility Advisory Committee to do their work on uh, the fact that we don't have as many site plans? Thank you. So through the mayor to, to council there, uh, this is something that we actually identified earlier on this year. Um, I believe it was Bill 23 that is making those changes. Uh, we had planning staff come to Joint Accessibility Advisory Committee to provide a report and potential effects that's gonna have on site plans. Um, you're correct, obviously, with the, the, the residential piece of it. Uh, residential site plans generally wouldn't come to uh, the Joint Accessibility Advisory Committee unless there was something that we wanted to really kind of uh, pinpoint and hone in uh, with respect to parking. Uh, so overall, it's not going to change things for the Joint Accessibility Advisory Committee because we're still looking at uh, commercial and uh, industrial properties. So those will still come forward. I will say with respect to timelines, um, lower tier staff, especially uh, North Perth, are very prudent of giving us those uh, site plans well in advance with ample time. Uh, we usually look at about a 24 to 48 hours to uh, roll over a subcommittee and then review that usually within a week to get that information back with comment uh, as to not delay the process. Thank you very much. Okay, anyone else with uh, comments at this point? All right, I have a resolution for our consideration as follows. The council receives the 2023 to 2027 Joint Accessibility Plan Report and the Council approves the Perth County 2023 to 2027 Joint Accessibility Plan. Uh, Councillor Anstead, would you be willing to move that? Yes, I'd be happy to move that. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, seconder, Councillor Rothwell, thank you. Any discussion or debate? Seeing none, let's have that vote. And that is carried. Thank you. And special thanks to Mr. Sager and Ms. Cannon for your presentation and, and being with us tonight, answering our questions. Glad to have you with us, even in the evening. All right, that brings us to item number five, reports from departments and key staff. For item 5.1.1, North Perth CAO Chris Snell has brought forward a report that outlines in broad strokes the plan for this year's Celebrate North Perth Awards and Appreciation Night. Welcome, Mr. Snell, at the podium. Uh, the floor. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, Council. As um, mentioned at the last Council meeting, um, Council did request an update on um, the North Celebrate North Perth Awards and Appreciation Night. Um, as I said, this was already in the process, so since um, that meeting, the nomination process has gone live. It's available now to anybody who's looking to um, nominate somebody for the Norm Sterling Citizen of the Year Award, or as well as the Inspiration, um, Celebrate North Perth Inspiration Award, and those details are available on our website. We encourage everybody to um, seek out our um, website at www.northperth.ca backslash nominate, and they can see all the information on the awards and, and make a nomination of a deserving citizen. We're looking to have a, a, a night of celebration in North Perth during National Volunteer Week. Um, National Volunteer Week runs from April 16th to the 23rd. We're looking at a local event on Tuesday, April the 18th at 6.45 at the EMCC. We will be inviting all our service clubs and local volunteers once the event details are all finalized. But basically it's gonna be a, a, a night to celebrate um, the nominations as well as um, all our volunteers in our community. Um, we're also looking at hosting a sort of a showcase of volunteer opportunities in the community. And we're just kind of working on the details on this, but would allow our volunteer and service clubs to sort of have a uh, an opportunity to display um, what they do in our community and if what their volunteers are doing to um, um, support our community and then look um, for a way to do volunteer attraction as well. So that's the outline of the night that we have planned so far. There'll be more details to come, including an invitation to all council members. And I'm willing to answer any questions council may have. All right. Uh, thank you, CAO Snell. Uh, questions or comments? Uh, Councillor Blazek. 
Um, uh, this, this isn't a question, it's a comment. I love that you're doing a showcase and allowing service clubs and, and uh, the opportunity to showcase what they do and volunteer recruit. Love it. Great idea. Thank you. Um, anyone else with questions or first comments on this one? Stay tuned. I think there's uh, more coming soon enough. Uh, we have a resolution as follows that the Council of the Municipality of North Perth receives a report entitled 2022 Celebrate North Perth Awards Appreciation Night for Information. Can I call for a mover? Uh, Councillor Duncan, thank you. And I saw Councillor Richardson's hand on this side as our seconder. Any discussion or debate? Seeing none, let's have that vote. And that is carried. Thank you very much, CEO Snell and the team that's working on this. Um, we appreciate all the efforts that are be beginning to take shape. Uh, next up is item 5.2, reports from the strategic initiatives portfolio tonight. And it seems like a rare night. We don't have a report from that group. Uh, and uh, we know that they continue to work hard on some really interesting files. Uh, we have no reports coming from the manager of corporate services tonight as item 5.3. Uh, likewise, we have no reports from the programs department tonight as 5.4, nor from the facilities department as 5.5, which kicks us down the road to item 5.6, where we get to engage. Uh, reports from our manager of environmental services as item 5.6.1. Our manager of environmental services, Mr. Mark Hackett, has invited a report from engineering consultants GM Blue Plan pertaining to the wastewater treatment capacity available in the North Perth system. I'm going to invite Mr. Hackett first to the microphone to introduce our guest, his guest uh, from the engineering team. Mr. Hackett, uh, the microphone is yours. Let me just get the camera source on you too. Here we go. go. Thank you, Mayor Kaysenberg and Council. Many of you may know Matt Ash already. Um, Matt's a local fella, and he's been with GM Blue Plan for a number of years now, and he's going to give us an update. We did talk briefly a couple of weeks ago about reserve capacities at the wastewater treatment plant, and he's going to kind of walk you through some of that and, and how we get to the numbers we get to. So welcome, Matt Ash. Thank you, Mayor Todd. Yes, I've lived here 25 years. I'm almost a local. I'm getting close. <laughs> so thank you for having me. I'm, I'm here to discuss the uh, wastewater treatment plant uh, that is so vital to this community and has supported the growth uh, to date. I understand there's been some questions from Council, and so I'm hoping I can answer at least some of them tonight. I will try to keep my technical jargon to a minimum if possible. Uh -oh. oh, there we go. So, yes, uh, North Perth has, of course, some of you may know this already, but a very modern wastewater treatment plant. It's located out on Line 84, just west of Highway 23. That's an aerial photo. You can see that photo is actually from 2011, so it's a little bit old now, but uh, it still generally looks like that. Keep my notes here. So the wastewater system in North Perth, and uh, it only really serves Listable and Atwood proper, of course, uh, it contains four separate major components. There's the collection system, and that comprises uh, sewers throughout both Listable and Atwood. You can see there's uh, about 51 kilometers of sewers uh, in Listable, and uh, another seven kilometers in Atwood. There's the transmission system, which consists of various pump stations throughout Listable and Atwood, as well as the main Highway 23 pump station. That's where all the sewage comes through from Listable. Uh, everything is pumped to the wastewater plant because it's actually uh, higher than both Atwood and Listable for some reason. I didn't choose the location. That's where it is. Uh, so everything has to be pumped there. Of course, the other part is treatment. And finally, discharge uh, is the, the section of the plant that discharges the effluent back to the mainland river. Uh, it actually 
discharges just before the bridge on Highway 23. The wastewater treatment plant in North Perth is actually your single largest asset by value, um, by a fair margin, in fact. Uh, so it's important to consider that. So first, a bit of history, and yes, back in the 1800s, that's probably exactly what it was like. So starting in 1959, uh, the lagoons were constructed. So out on Line 84, there's two very large lagoons that are connected to the treatment plant. That was the original treatment system. There was a pump station constructed in 1959 as well, right at, uh, beside the Campbell Soup plant, and a single force main that was extended out to the lagoon on the east side. That was the primary treatment lagoon. Sewage then went into the west lagoon for secondary treatment and was discharged to the Chapman drain, which is the municipal drain that runs out in front of the plant. Uh, that's how it was done in 1959. Oddly enough, sewers were actually first placed in Listable as early as 1947. So what went on between 47 and 59? I'm not sure. For context, however, for those of you who may not be aware, the first treatment plant in the city of Toronto was constructed in 1943, so we were actually only 16 years behind that, which isn't real bad. So the next step, so between 1961 and 1991, there wasn't a whole lot done in terms of expansion out there, although in the early 1980s, we started to experience some population growth. And of course, at this time, this is pre-amalgamation, so I'm talking specifically listable here. There was, however, a, a building freeze, a development freeze from roughly 1985 to around 1992, because they were running out of treatment capacity. So in 1991, they built a new pump station to replace the one that was originally there in 1959, as well as two new force mains, one for raw sewage and one for effluent back to the river. Uh, they abandoned the outlet into the the Chapman drain at that time. And then in 1994, the new mechanical treatment plant came online. It actually started construction earlier than that. I believe it was around 92 they began construction. In 94, it was completed. The expansion studies began in the mid-1980s for all of this. It took quite a few years. Uh, interestingly, before 1992, the plant was actually directly operated by the Ministry of the Environment back then the province operated wastewater plants. In 92, they got out of that business, and uh, the town of Listable at the time hired American Water to operate it. It's since transitioned to North Perth's own staff. That's kind of a diagram of what it looked like in 1992. The lagoons were still there, but the new treatment plant was in place, and there was the force mains both there and back, and of course, we were no longer using the Chapman drain for outlet. The main reason was the Chapman drain does not have sufficient base flow to assimilate the effluent from the plant. So it was a better idea to go back to the river. Since then, there's been a, a flurry of activity. Um, in 2000, the wastewater plant was upgraded to a, a different kind of treatment study, uh, treatment system. Prior to that, as I said, the lagoons were part of the treatment system and sludge from the, uh, the wastewater treatment was actually deposited in the East Lagoon. That in the long run is probably not a great idea because it's hard to get it back out again. So in 2000, they changed the treatment system so that there was a sludge processing and storage area on site. That way they could capture that and land apply it without having it uh, sit in that lagoon. In 2006, there was a septage receiving construction, a station constructed. That station accepts hauled waste from various rural industries throughout the area. It's actually quite critical to a number of them. Some may not be able to exist without that facility. It's relatively unique, although it's certainly not the only one in Ontario, but they are fairly few and far between. In 2010, there was upgrades to the pump station, uh, I did skip over, sorry, 2007. The biological treatment system was improved. That actually allowed us to double the amount of waste we could treat out there uh, without expanding any of the tanks themselves. It was a, a very successful upgrade. 
There was a master plan completed in 2015 that was done to chart out the course of the wastewater plant to determine what upgrades were going to be required, what sort of flows we would see in the future, all that predictive stuff that we love to get wrong. Uh, most of that has been accomplished now, most of the recommended upgrades, but not all of them. In 2018 and 2019, there was a major upgrade done at the plant. Uh, some of you may remember that. It was about a $13 million job that extended over two years. Uh, we put in new headworks, new sludge treatment, a, a larger electrical service, standby generator, uh, and we put another uh, force main in. The concern previous to that was there was one raw sewage force main coming from town, and if there had ever been a problem with it, uh, we would have serious consequences. So now there's two for redundancy. And then this coming year, or this year and the following, there are further upgrades planned, uh, improvements to the septic receiving station, how we deal with that wastewater that we get in there, and uh, replacement of the clarifier, and I'll go over what a clarifier is later. Uh, that equipment is being replaced as well. It's original to the plant, so it's now 30-odd years old, and it's reaching the end of its lifespan. So just a little diagram of what it looks like now. You can see the lagoons are no longer highlighted. That's because they are no longer part of the process. The plant is now fully mechanical and self-contained, although the lagoons are still connected, and they can be used for emergency purposes. I just include this because it looks very nice. It's a fancy, we call it a process flow diagram. Uh, this is actually a high level one. It's much more detailed than that. But if you can compare that to 1959, there would have been two lines on this diagram. So we've come a long way in that time. So how does it work? Well, it's, and there's a lot of terms here, I'm sorry, but it's a tertiary biological nutrient removal mechanical plant. This plant is actually capable of treating very high strength wastewater. It's somewhat unique for a municipal plant. It's rated to treat 9,030 cubic meters per day. I don't know how they got the 30 back in the day. Why didn't they just round it off? I don't know. Uh, that's an annual average. Uh, peak flow rate can actually be up to 25,500 cubic meters per day. Um, so the, the average is calculated at the end of the year. They take all of the days and average it out, and that's what you can't exceed. There's four main process steps, as I said. There's uh, primary, secondary, tertiary, and biosolids management, and we'll go over all of that. Uh, the process is heavily reliant on microorganisms, so that's important to remember. This is actually a, a living, breathing system, and it actually does breathe. The primary treatment is the what we call the headworks building. So on the left, you can see the first part of that. There's an enclosed kind of angled thing. That's the screening system. It has a screen on the bottom that captures all of the large stuff coming through, rags and what have you. And then it's got a traveling rake, sort of like a bale elevator. It goes up and down and, and cleans it off continually, goes into a compactor. Uh, in the next room, over, there is the grit removal system. That's the tank on the left. It's a little hard to see. It settles out the, the heavier particles, the grit and whatnot. And on the right is uh, the fats, oils, and grease removal system. We call that fog. That's uh, a bit of a unique part to this plant as well. We get a lot of wastewater here that's heavy in oils and whatnot. That's basically a settling tank. It allows a lot to rise to the top. And then there's an air removal system that skims it off and uh, it's placed in large bins for disposal. The, uh, the building actually is subject to gas problems and I'll, I'll be honest about that. Uh, there's sometimes some significant gas issues come out of particularly the hauled waste. So you can see there's some large fans in those pictures. There's also some uh, white pipe that's for uh, there's jet fans that are sucking the air out of that building. It's certainly much better now, but we're planning to do some further improvements this year to, uh, to help that. The primary issue is hydrogen sulfide gas, which not only being a, a health concern, is actually corrosive 
because when it combines with water vapor, it makes sulfuric acid. The secondary treatment system is the biologic nutrient removal system, a very fancy term. It basically means it can treat very high strength waste. It's really good at removing nitrates, nitrites, ammonia. Uh, those things are very bad in the receiving stream. So this is excellent at removing those things. Uh, as I said, when we built this in 2007, we did not expand the physical tank size at all. That's the original tank to the plant. But the change to this type of a treatment system allowed us to actually double the loading that the plant could handle without any other physical changes. Those tanks are actually quite deep. I think they're around 12 to 14 feet deep, so there's a lot of liquid in there. Um, this system has to be sustained by proper management. It needs certain levels of oxygen in both zones. It needs a certain pH level, temperature, etc. So that's all maintained by plant staff and automated control systems out there. Oops. This one, gotcha, okay. Tertiary treatment, so after the uh, wastewater goes through the secondary, the, the BNR system, it comes into the tertiary. So first it goes to clarification. So after it comes out of the, the aeration chamber, it's mixed with alum, which is aluminum sulfate. That promotes flocculation, where the heavy particles clump together. It then goes into these clarifiers, which are large, round, circular tanks. They're quite deep. I think they're on the order of 18 feet deep, something like that. Uh, it enters at the bottom, and it slowly rises to the top. And, of course, the heavier particles clump together and fall to the bottom. The water comes to the top. It separates everything out. The water then overflows the top, and there's collection chambers around the outside. After that, it goes to the sand filters, which are on the right. Um, they're just, as it sounds, large uh, beds of sand underlain with porous plates. The wastewater flows in on top of them, filters down through the sand, and is further cleaned. The last step is ultraviolet disinfection, and that uh, deactivates the pathogens in the wastewater. It's much better than chlorine because chlorine, of course, is detrimental to the environment. So it's a good system. The effluent coming out of here is... Uh, is very good quality. In fact, uh, during the summer, it's of better quality than the, the water that's in the river. And uh, as well, the effluent from this plant adds much needed base flow to the river during dry season. So uh, it's actually beneficial to the river uh, at certain times of year for sure. Biosolids management is the other major component of this facility, and the solids I talked about that set up to the bottom of the clarifiers, they are collected, and they are transported to the, the digester, we call it, where they're further processed. So they are aerobically digested by microbes to reduce their volume and further deactivate pathogens in them. Uh, this uh, system actually reduces volume both by digestion and by settling. So when the air is turned off, it settles out similar to the clarifier. A water layer forms on top, they decant it, and now there are less biosolids to deal with because it's thicker. There's a large storage cell on the site, which is the picture on the left. That's where it's stored before it's land applied. All the biosolids from this facility that are land applied on farm fields are done so by injection purposes, so it's not sprayed or surface applied, it's always injected, and they do have to be tested before they can be applied to. So how good is your treatment? Well, very good. Um, now, I mean, these bars don't represent any particular number, but uh, BOD, which is biological oxygen demand, that's basically a measurement of how much organic contaminant is in the wastewater. Uh, your plant removes roughly 99% of that contaminant. Phosphorus, which of course is a, a fertilizer, as every farmer knows, or gardener, um, it's detrimental to water, it creates algal blooms. Uh, the plant removes about 97% of phosphorus from all incoming wastewater. Total suspended solids, they create uh, siltation, uh, clarity issues in water, it's basically small particles. Um, plant removes about 99% of that. 
And nitrogen, once again, another powerful fertilizer uh, that is detrimental to aquatic life. You remove about 94% of that, which is also a good number. Most of the stuff that's removed ends up in the sludge, which makes it an excellent fertilizer, of course. Oops, wrong one. Uncommitted reserve capacity. So I believe you have the uncommitted reserve report in your council pack, I, I think. Uh, it goes over what that is, but I'll step through it step by step. It's something we do every year. Uh, it's a calculation that's provided by the Ministry of Environment. It's been around a long time. The results of this calculation used to go directly to municipal affairs back when they had a direct hand in improving development applications. That's no longer the case, uh, but it's basically the same calculation. It's meant to be a relatively simple calculation, and for the most part, it is. So there's five inputs. The first one is the hydraulic reserve capacity, and that's a, a simple calculation. It just takes the uh, rolling three-year average of how much flow is coming into the plant, and we subtract that from the rated capacity. We use a rolling average to try and shave the peaks, and the ministry does allow that because systems tend to have up and downs year to year. They actually allow us to use either a three or a five year rolling average. However, right now the three and five year come to basically the same number. So we've stuck with the three year. You can see though that there is definitely an upward trend to the flow that's coming into the plant. That's certainly to be expected given that we're a growing community. Second input is the number of unconnected approved lots. And this is a definition that the ministry provides. They say that approved lots are anything that is draft plan approved or registered. Uh, so this list is provided by your planning department and shows every unit. These are not lots necessarily. Some are multis, so there's it's in unit numbers uh, based on everything that is currently registered and everything that is currently draft approved. This is as of December 31st, 2022. To that, uh, and we don't have to, but we add an estimation for infill lots, knowing that there is infill activity going on. So we simply picked a number of 5% of existing connections, which came up to be 249 infill lots and added that in to the calculation. That way you have some reserve held back for those people that want to do infill and that sort of thing. I do note that these numbers are for serviced only. We know there are other developments in the municipality that are unserviced. They don't factor into this calculation. Existing connected population. This is always a tough one to figure out. Um, there is some census information available and we have some guesstimates on other things, Atwood in particular. Uh, so this is how we get our estimate for the serviced population right now of 10,857. I would say it's, it's probably relatively close. Um, we're not quite sure exactly what it is because of the census is not that detailed. Number of connected households. Well, this comes directly from your utility department. They maintain this number year to year. So right now it's 4,980 connected households. We don't account for industrial commercial separately as that is included in the overall flow number. And generally speaking, it's expected that it will go up proportional to residential growth. I also acknowledge that's not always true. There are special cases and we deal with those discreetly when they come along. The average daily flow per capita, that's simply a calculation, dividing input number one by number three. You can see that the, the trend is on a downward basis. This is good. That's what we would expect as a system grows and matures. We expect that the flow per person will decrease. Uh, that means that the residential base is starting to suppress some of those flows that we have no direct control over, the large industrial flows, the inflow and infiltration. Uh, as your residential base grows, I would expect to see this number keep going down. Of course, 640 liters per day 
you know, people do not use that. That reflects all of the other flows that are included in the calculation, industrial, rainfall, all those things. So we put those numbers in the, the calculation provided by the ministry, and what we come up with is a cubic meter, a flow that is uncommitted. So right now it's 1,257 cubic meters per day that is currently uncommitted. We then back calculate that into units. So I use the population divided by the households to arrive at 2.18 persons per unit which then translates into another 898 additional units that could theoretically be approved without exceeding the capacity of the plant. You can see in the table, uh, there is a list that your planning department maintains of future development lands within the settlement boundary and how many units they think those properties would support. Right now that's listed at 494. You know, whether that's true or not, hard to say but it's less than the reserve capacity. I did purposely note that this is within the settlement boundary only. We do know that there is talk of a settlement boundary expansion. Whether that happens or not, I don't know. Uh, but I do know that there are proposed developments outside of the settlement boundary that could account for 1,000 to 1,500 lots on top of this, potentially. Uh, and this is all speculative, of course as well as there's industrial commercial subdivision, there's a proposal to connect the Wallace Industrial Park, so these things all need to be accounted for. You might say, well, if we bring all that in, we'll clearly exceed our rated capacity. Maybe, maybe not. Uh, the calculation is a moving target. All of those inputs change every year, and you can actually gain capacity on a year-to-year -year basis, even though you have development. So I said, what does it all mean? It means you have 833 approved lots that have yet to be built on, and you can potentially approve another 898. The uh, uncommitted calculation should be updated annually and always has been. Um, there are factors beyond your control, somewhat beyond your control, that may influence it. Uh, industrial flows in particular, inflow and infiltration, wet weather years, no system is completely watertight. Um, anywhere. There's always leaks. Uh, the other things that may affect this calculation in the future, one will be densification. Um, I believe the 2.18 persons per household is probably too low. I think in the future we'll see that increase. We'll also see the number of households per hectare increase. So I think there'll be less land use being eaten up uh, to support a higher population. How that will affect your reserve in the future is a little bit unknown yet. We're not quite sure, but I expect it will affect it. I love statistics. So what's happened since 2016? This is actually quite interesting. The list will system itself, the flow has actually decreased slightly. And this points to some very good inflow and infiltration work by your staff. Um, they've done a lot of work since 2016 to try and seal those leaks up. And it's working. Uh, the majority of the, the flow increase has been driven by Erie Meats. And frankly, that's a good news story. It means the plant is operating at a high level and employing a lot of people. We do suspect that they're probably close to maxed out, so you may not see that number influence your overall flow as much in the future. The septage receiving station is actually your second largest driver, but the overall flow from the SRS is quite low compared to the other three categories. This is a very busy slide, but we have data going way back to the 1970s of population and a, a little bit of flow as well. So the blue bars are population, the red is flow. Um, so you can see starting in the mid-1980s, there was a growth trend, and that's kind of what prompted the... Uh, that's not me. Is that me? No. <laughs> that's what prompted the upgrades. Uh, you can also see in 2010 when the Atwood system came online, that's when we saw a jump in connected population 
uh, for that. And then, of course, there's been significant growth in the last few years. But to me, what's uh, interesting here is that the flow from the mid-1980s was not much different than the flow uh, recently. And I think there's probably two drivers for that. Number one, the system was likely quite leaky back then. And secondly, the Campbell Soup Company was in full operation at that time, and they created a lot of flow. We try and predict when you will reach your rated capacity. Um, I always like to do a best, mid, and worst case, all three of which are wrong. But I try to get some idea of when we might be getting there. Right now, I think at current uh, growth rates, you're at least 10 years away, possibly more, from reaching rated capacity, which may sound like a long time, but when you consider all the work that needs to be done to re-rate the plant, it's actually not. Uh, so it's just something to keep on top of. North Perth's been very good at managing their wastewater system, and you're ahead of the curve in many ways, uh, but it's something to, to keep in mind, and you have to keep on top of it all the time. So speaking of that, future actions. So when your wastewater system hits 80% of rated capacity, your average flow, that's long been considered the trigger for action by the ministry. And when I say trigger for action, that does not mean a development freeze. Some people think it does, it does not. It means you need to start planning for an upgrade for a re-rating. Uh, there are frankly lots of municipalities that routinely operate at greater than 80% capacity. So some of the future steps continue with the I and I work. It's a very high payback item. Uh, for the amount you spend, you gain a lot. Uh, continue to ensure that new development and reconstruction projects and all that use good construction practices. Your staff have been good at that. They've updated the development standards. They are enforcing more testing in subdivisions on sewers. Uh, so we have a better leak-free system. I shouldn't say leak-free, less leaky system. Uh, this year, as I mentioned, we'll be replacing a bunch of the equipment. Uh, part of that will be some improvements at the septage receiving station to reduce the hydrogen sulfide gas that's being generated there, uh, get rid of it before it gets into that headworks building. We're hoping we can clean that problem up this year. Begin uh, planning for the replacement of those sand filters that I showed you. They are a known bottleneck. We've been discussing them for years. We know that they will not sustain a higher flow, so any re-rated plant uh, will have to have new filters for sure. We have to keep, uh, we're doing some river monitoring, so both low flow and quality monitoring of the river. That's part of the ministry's request right now, that we have some long-term data on what the river does. They will use that to determine what you can discharge as far as contaminant levels go. The hauled waste stream is one to keep uh, uh, tabs on. Your staff has done a good job on that. Uh, it's a matter of monitoring the incoming waste, to determine what they're bringing in, reject those things that you shouldn't have, and uh, manage those that you need to take. Uh, some of that may be enforcing pretreatment at source, which is really the best result possible, but we acknowledge that some rural industrial facilities don't have the capacity to do that. So. It's a balancing act. Before you do any major expansion to the plant, you will need to do what's called a municipal class environmental assessment, which is basically a, a large grandiose study to examine all the options, the socioeconomic factors, environmental factors, etc., and determine what the preferred solution is. That study will take one to two years, I would expect, uh, but has to be done before any re-rating can be considered. And financially plan for a major expansion sometime in the next two decades. And major in this case means big dollars, I would expect. Uh, so frankly, you're, you've done a good job. I, I know that you have a substantial reserve built into this system. And uh, I don't think it's going to be an issue personally, but it's just a matter of something to keep on top of. And you may want to consider formalizing your reserve capacity allocation. And what I mean by that is do it similar to draft plan approval in that you have a register of what developments 
our allocated capacity, not just subdivisions, but that could also be applied to severances, rezonings, et cetera, so that you know who out there has what capacity and put an expiry on it so they have to use it within a certain amount of time. As part of that, you may also want to consider keeping some for social purposes, public purposes, and I mean by that, uh, hold some back for a hospital expansion, for emergency services, for social housing, what have you. These sorts of things that are in the public interest, you may want to keep some for that, uh, rather than just allow developers to take up everything. So that's really uh, the, just, the gist of my presentation tonight. My grandson is fully prepared to take questions, <laughs> as am I. All right. Well, he is our future, Matt. So, <laughs> sure enough, if, if he's going to help us uh, plan the future system, we're grateful for that, too. Uh, let's go first with Councillor Richardson. Go ahead. Thank you, and through you, uh, Mayor Kaysenberg, thank you so much, Mr. Ash, for a very informative um, uh, presentation. And the whole premise of wastewater treatment facilities is our still considered modern? Or is it getting, I know it's still dated. We've done an awful lot and spent a lot of money of it over the years to update it, but it was also built in 94. I'm just wondering, is it still considered modern facility? Well, for sure. I mean, uh, for one thing, it doesn't use lagoons, which is a kind of an antiquated system, and that lagoon systems really limit your treatment capacity. So this plant, for sure, is a modern plant. The parts of it that were built in, you know, 92, 93, 94, frankly, there's not a whole lot of that that's left. Uh, most of it's been upgraded in some manner, other than clarifiers and filters, as I said. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Blazek is next. Thank you, Mr. Ash, for your presentation. I we really appreciate your expertise. There's a lot of information here for us to continue to digest. Um, I don't know if my question is for you or if it is for Mr. Hackett. Um, you mentioned um, in the um, primary treatment in the Headworks building this gas problem. Um, you mentioned it again in your future steps. Um, and I'm just wondering, like, are there concerns about employee safety? Are we regularly testing the air quality, anything like that? And, and, and subsequent to that, um, you mentioned upgrades, and can you elaborate on that? Yes, so the Headworks contains uh, various air monitoring systems. They're online monitoring, so they constantly monitor. It's not periodic. Uh, the staff also carry gas monitors with them. Right now, I was actually in there a week ago. The levels are below the dangerous level right now, uh, but I don't think that's always the case. They do occasionally climb up over it. Uh, so part of the upgrades that we're planning is uh, called a jet aeration system to be installed in the separate receiving station. The septage receiving station is primarily where the gas problems originate because it's high strength waste. So we're putting a system in there that uses air stripping and that system will strip the H2S gas out of that waste before it gets into the headworks building. Councillor Andreessen is next. Yes, thank you to you, Mayor Kaysenberg. Um, appreciate this very Formative presentation, very important that we have this facility for our community. Um, my question might be for you or for Mr. Hackett, I'm not sure. Um, it's interesting that we accept a lot of um, industrial um, waste through, through haulage. Do those companies have to pay for usage of our plant for those purposes? I think you might. Yes, thank you for the question. Um, yeah, definitely anyone that, um, any of our septage receiving station haulers um, have an agreement with us. And, and the way that we do it is um, we look at all the different lab analysis that we do. And on an annual basis, we review that um, 
testing and it gets put into a calculation that we have that spits out a number of what they pay per cubic meter for what they bring in. So if they bring waste that's stronger, they pay more. Mm -hmm. If they bring waste um, that's lighter, then it's light. And it also is an encouragement for them to do pretreatment because if they do something to make it lighter, they would actually, in theory, pay less per cubic meter. So it's a revenue stream that we've used um, uh, at the plant for since 2006, and we actually had um, beer waste, I believe, coming in from Formosa at one time prior to that in a different system. But um, it's something that we're able to provide um, as a service to surrounding areas. And, um, and again, it's something we, ha we monitor very closely. And you know, some, as we move forward, there may be difficult or tough decisions we have to make about what we receive as well because it puts a demand on the plant as well. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Councillor Johnston is next. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Matt and Mark. Uh, I don't know who wants this one. Um, as we plan for a major expansion, do we physically have the room out there to expand, or will it be the equipment, or you know, will the lagoons eventually go as we need to expand? I can take a crack at that one, Matt. You might have to help me out, but um, probably the 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 next major thing after we do the clarifiers and after we do the filters, those are known ones we have to do, um, and we're hopefully that we could be re-rated that at that point by doing that and being able to prove that we could handle um, higher flows. The next big expansion after that would be an additional aeration tank. You saw the ones in the picture that they're original. Um, that would go out into the Laguna Touch. But there's land there for that. That would be fine. And then um, the digesters themselves that we just put in a few years ago, if that needs to be expanded, there's a spot on the side of it. Like there's two tanks now, an additional third tank. Most of the buildings have been built with um, some redundancy. So if there's uh, more pumps or things like that, more piping needs to be put in, there's been room for that. They have given thought for that for the future coming down the road. Is that right? Well, pretty good. Okay. okay. All right. Looks like uh, Mr. Ash is happy with your answer, Mr. Hackett. So there you go. Um, I, I actually have a question, and, and this might be uh, Mr. Ash. Uh, so um, I, I just did some back of the napkin math here, and you mentioned that there's 898. Well, let's call it 900. Um, uh, you know, capacity for expansion before we hit that 80 percent threshold. Um, when I do the, the straight line math, the straight line math says if, if we accommodate 150 new doors a year, that we're, we're running at that 80% capacity at six years, not 10. So I know that you mentioned there was a window and, and you sort of projecting to 10 years, but the worst case scenario is actually six following the straight line, mm -hmm. right? Is it fair? Like, it, could we be as soon as six years needing to, to deal with an expansion? Well, a lot depends on pace of development, of course, and, and you know, we try and crystal ball that. Um, it also depends on your heavy industrial users, uh, what they're going to put out in the following years. But from a straight line number, yes, there's 900 that you can approve further, and you have about 800 and, say, 800 in the hopper already. So those two numbers combined are about 1,700 units. Um, and you, you do, what, 160 a year? Is that correct? Or, uh, yeah. I just used as an estimate 150 new doors just for the sake of argument, right? It, yeah. it, we've been somewhere in that range over the last three or four years. So. Yeah, so on a straight line basis, you know, 1,700 units at, a, say, 160 a year, that's roughly 11 years. That I, yeah. Good. Okay. Um, CEO Snell, you want to weigh in on this one? Let me get your microphone. I think the interesting part of the calculation, uh, Matt briefly mentioned it in his, his um, presentation, is because, of the, because we're dealing with the infiltration problems, and, and actually I give staff a lot of credit, we've fixed up some of our major problems. That number has actually been worse since I've been here. We were down as low as 200 at one time. Um, but because we've made improvements in infiltration, we can boost that number up. So I agree, if you look at a straight line, um, you're probably not far off, ex except there are uh, ones that are already in the hopper. So that's right, we have about 1,700 units that we could probably accommodate. 
In the meantime, though, we're making improvements all the time with infiltration. So if you look at sort of July when there's no rain and we're just putting in wastewater, we're running at about, well, less than, we're running less than um, 5,000 easily. Um, so the other half of that, or the other at least 40% of that actually is we're treating rainwater, for lack of a better word. If we could get all that rainwater out, which Matt's correct, it's possible to get it all out, but if we could continue to get it out, we would find capacity that, capacity we haven't even used yet, for that, pardon the pun, um, because we're treating, and I, I'd hate to figure the calculation out, but we're probably treating on average 3,000 cubic meters per day of rainwater across the whole year, which is just, um, and that gets into our system of riding waste by people putting their sub pumps directly into the sanitary sewer system, which is against the law, but we know it happens. Um, um, roof leaders going into the sanitary system, old infrastructure. Um, um, some of our, we, we know we have an issue when the river rises that we have infiltration, so we have some, some concerns in the, in, the, in the river flats that we're looking at actually the last couple of years and hoping to make improvements on them shortly. There's a number of things. So it's just not driven by development. We can also reverse the trend by, by getting that rainwater out of the system. Um, you've sort of raised it to my next question, if I might ask it, and that is, um, if we apply the climate change lens to this, how does that influence the, the numbers, projections that you've been talking about, Mr. Ash? Well, I'm not currently taking into account climate change, although that doesn't mean that it won't impact it. It certainly will. I'm just unable to determine how. I would expect that you know we will continue to see more flash flood type events, uh, more intense rainfall periods. Um, that's been the common theme lately. Um, as Chris rightly pointed out, your system has some vulnerable areas, I would call them, down in the river flats, and I think that's something that needs to be targeted uh, to ensure that those are largely leak-free uh, to get ahead of some of this. You know. The more work we can do to keep water out, especially the river, the better off you're going to be. Just as an observation, I mean, if I followed what you were saying earlier, uh, CEO Snell, you talked about trying to, to reduce um, flows of rainwater into the system, but in fact, we are expecting more, or at least that's the projection at this point. So it looks like you do want to weigh in on this. It's interesting, and we haven't got data together to, to prove this um, completely. But the most infiltration happens when our ground's already saturated and we get more rain. So, for example, the July thunderstorms don't necessarily affect us as much as um, a heavy rainstorm after a snow melt because we've already got heavy saturation in the system. And then we have weather problems. So the, the July-August climate change impacts don't directly impact us as much as um, maybe some of those um, January to um, April impacts do, but actually snow loads like we've had this year actually are actually helpful to us because we, we haven't had four feet of snow and then really big melts. It's been fairly gradual, um, and our probably numbers are going to actually improve this year, um, knock on wood, just with the way our winter's been. So it's it's... It's not necessarily, the climate change is interesting, and I think it's something we will continue to monitor because it, it's, it's the type of climate change, whether it's a mild winter, how are the milder winters going to impact our sewage treatment plant? One little story, I'll get there, uh, Councillor Rothwell. So the, the last question then is, um, you know, we've talked about this number of 10 or 11 years tonight. But the straight line, you know, the worst case scenario is it's looking could be six years. Uh, climate change could intervene one way or the other, from what I'm hearing. Um, should we be, should this council in its four year term begin to be involved in planning the, the expansion of this facility? I, 
I think the answer to that is yes. Um, you should start the environmental assessment. I would say, obviously not this year, potentially next year or in 2025. Thanks. Uh, Councillor Rothwell. Thanks very much, Mayor Todd, and thanks, uh, Matt, for your presentation, and, and Mark as well. Uh, we have heard uh, some municipalities, uh, their sewage treatment uh, uh, plants, wastewater treatment plants, have had issues with bypasses, and we hear this in passing in comments from time to time within our municipality. Can you tell us specifically, have we had uh, a bypass of our sewage treatment system in the recent past, or, or what's the answer to that? Well, your system is designed to bypass under certain conditions, yes. But have you had a bypass, Mark? He'll, he'll have to answer. Um, um, no, we haven't had any uh, sewer uh, or uh, raw bypasses. I think that's what we're referring to, where what, the flow is coming into the pump station and we can't get rid of it quick enough. We have not had any. We did do a planned partial bypass of the um, of the final effluent or the, the filters this year um, just to we have a lot of water in those lagoons that we have to control and we've been dealing with a, an algae issue there we're having getting trouble getting it through the filters those filters are old and they need a lot of work and we do a lot of maintenance work on them and so while we were trying to get one of the filters um, the sand replaced and the porous plates cleaned. We did do, with the ministry's approval, a planned bypass where we let a little bit of extra flow go. It was still met majority of the uh, compliance numbers that we have to meet, but it was about a three week period where we, we had a bit more flow, but I wouldn't call that a bypass. That's a, a planned, um, yeah, it's still treated. It goes through the full treatment of the plant. So, but we have not had like a raw sewage bypass. And I. Could, I'd have to look when the last one was. It's been many, many years. Thank, thanks very much for that. I think that should give uh, uh, confidence to our uh, residents, our municipality, uh, uh, as well as uh, uh, those uh, businesses and industries that uh, do use our facilities, that we do have that capacity and that uh, infrastructure to, and, and staff to be able to handle that. So I appreciate the answer. Uh, one other, uh, it's not really a question, but more a statement. Uh, so it's not just our... Uh, various businesses and industries that use the sewage treatment plant, uh, but all of our uh, sewage systems on our farms and so on, where we've got uh, residences and others that have our uh, septic tanks pumped out, whether it's three to five years or whatever it is, our haulers, if they're coming to the sewage treatment plant, they actually build in their costs to the uh, proponent or to the uh, owners of the, of the sewage system. Is that correct? Yeah. That's right. We we would service any of this. There's a number of different septage haulers that would bring in septage to the wastewater treatment plant. So, in fact, I mean, the sewage treatment plant is not only a benefit to uh, Listowel and Atwood uh, service treatment areas and our business industry, but also to all of our uh, rural areas that do have uh, their septic tanks pumped out. So I just wanted to make that point as well. That's a very valid point. Good. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you. Deputy Mayor Kellum is next. Yes, uh, thank you, Mayor Kaysenberg, and thank you, Matt, for your presentation. To build on Councillor Andreessen's question about or comments with regards to uh, the trucking of waste uh, to be treated coming in, do we te test prior to them dumping, or we wait, and then if we see something that's out of line, we contact them after? No, we test while they're dumping, basically, while they're unloading at the plant. We have an automatic sampler that will take... A portion of sample that we would need and then we do the testing after it takes some of the tests take more than a week to get like a BOD test takes more it's a five-day test so then that's why once we have that information and, and if we do have any issues we usually know it fairly quickly if there's a lot of grease or something that comes in on a load it shows up at the plant and, and then we deal with that individual hauler we've charged out load or our costs to a hauler that brought in something that shouldn't be, that caused damage or something. It's pretty rare that that would happen. Okay. I don't know if that answers your question. That's perfect. That's okay. what I want to hear. Okay. Anyone else with questions or, or uh, comments? We don't have a resolution in our package for this. It's just sort of a presentation to council that uh, part training, part amplification of questions that council's had in the past. So I don't think any specific legislative action is required here at this point, but to thank you to the team. 
I understood a lot of that, Mr. Ash. That, that's very encouraging, actually. So um, thank you to, to Mr. Hackett for arranging this. We appreciate your time tonight and, uh, and your good service on behalf of our community. All right, let's turn now to item 5.8, reports from the Development and Protective Services Department. Uh, we have uh, for item 5.8.1, planning staff from the county have indicated that a revision to the North Perth zoning bylaw is warranted to give guidance and regulation related to additional uses on residential properties that have been severed from a farm operation through the consent process. This follows naturally from OPA 189, which was earlier passed by County Council and reflects planning input into a housekeeping amendment uh, to bring the zoning bylaw into alignment with the official plan amendment. We are asked to consider a housekeeping zoning bylaw amendment, and this is um, initiated internally, essentially. Uh, if we are in agreement with the policy direction proposed for the zoning bylaw amendment, we are asked to direct staff to organize a notice of public meeting for the purpose of public consultation. All of that said, County of Perth Planner Jerrica Gilbert, who works on North Perth Files, is with us to provide an overview and recommendation. Welcome, as always, Planner Gilbert. Uh, thank you, Mayor and Council. I'm glad to be back. I was away for a little bit there. So yes, this is a proposed housekeeping amendment. Um, housekeeping amendments are municipally initiated to the zoning bylaw, and they're useful for addressing the regulations and provisions for changes that are generally minor in nature, and they ensure that the document keeps pace with emerging trends in land use and updating the document with new policy requirements. So what I'm bringing forward tonight is changes that will affect the A1 uh, zone. So the A1 zone is in the agricultural zone, um, special provision one, and it refers specifically to the severed residential lots of surplus farm dwelling severances. So council has seen quite a few of these in the past few years, um, rezoning applications where uh, the severed farmland is rezoned to prevent any residential development, and then the severed portion with the existing house keeps the, um, it basically turns into a residential lot in the agricultural zone, which sounds a little funny, but it, it's working out so far. This on the screen is what the A1 zone currently reads. It's fairly basic, um, and the explanatory note basically says that the A1 zone is for surplus farm residential lots. So what happened in 2021 is OPA um, Official Plan Amendment 189 uh, revisited the surplus farm dwelling severance policies um, because at that point in time, surplus farm dwelling severances have been happening in North Perth for about four years. We started doing them in 2017. Um, and basically what OPA 189 does in addition to a few other changes is it allows for local zoning bylaws to consider permitting certain additional uses on surplus farm dwelling lots. Now these changes are optional uh, which is why we're coming forward to you tonight to ask for permission to circulate public notice which we do for 20 days like any other standard zoning bylaw amendment. So I'm just going to go through the changes that we're proposing tonight and kind of the reason why we're going through them. So the two uh, major ones that uh, OPA 189 enabled is limited um, non-commercial raising of livestock as an accessory use, and then also vocational uses such as trades or artists. So basically um, a home occupation or home industry in an accessory dwelling. So with the non-commercial raising of livestock, the department worked quite a bit on this one for OP189 um, in conjunction with HOMAFRA. So there's a new definition proposed along with a permitted use for the A1 zone. So the new definition goes in the de definition section of the bylaw and then the A1 zone refers to it. So the purpose behind allowing people to have livestock on their residential lots was for uh, promoting food security if they want to choose to um, have, say, chickens or that for meat or eggs. And especially important for um, North Perth and Perth East is we have a large Amish Mennonite pond, uh, population, 
where horses may actually be used for transportation purposes. Um, so the new definition, uh, we wanted to ensure that it looped back into our existing livestock definition, mostly because we didn't want to capture any uh, domestic pets bylaws. So in the countryside, you have a limitation on, say, dogs. Um, so livestock, we're going to refer back to 3... Uh, point 96, and that refers in turn to the minimum distance separation formula. Um, the reason for emphasizing the non-commercial aspect is that we absolutely don't want this to be perceived as limiting farm operations. Like the legislation from the Nutrient Management Act of, or anything of that sort, you can't limit um, how farms can expand. But when we were considering this, the idea behind it is that you're not going to be raising animals for sale or their byproducts or for services. It's meant to be extremely small scale and limited. And then in addition to the accessory use, we're going to put a maximum of two nutrient units. Um, which is, again, a reference to the Nutrient Management Act and the minimum distance separation formula. And um, they would also need to conform, um, conform with MDS setbacks. All right. And the next uh, new definition that we're considering added is for home industries. So the policy goal for this is to kind of allow residents with some flexibility when it comes to small business opportunities in um, the municipality, so long as they're limited in size and appropriate cited within on the lot. So the home industry definition includes trades, small manufacturing, and or artistic study. So it can include anything from electrician, plumber, carpenter, Painter, welder, just for example. Um, painter, woodworker, sculptor. So um, stuff that's slightly larger than a home occupation. So currently we do have provisions in the zoning bylaws for home occupations, and we're uh, considering permitting them in the A1 zone as well. Home occupations have to incur within the dwelling, though. They can't happen in an accessory structure. That's the main difference between this and a home industry. The home industry can occur in an accessory structure, and we did give some um, very limited outdoor storage. In order to kind of regulate the home industry um, use, there are general provisions in Section 5. Um, and basically, they all kind of surround that, um, keeping things small scale in nature. So no external evidence of the home industry, aside from a little sign. Um, no outdoor storage of goods, materials, or equipment, unless you're providing visual screening. The home industry absolutely can't create or nor become a nuisance or hazard to neighbors for a variety of reasons. Uh, we are proposing employees, but no more than two. Um, and as we were kind of considering that family members might be engaged all in one in operation. A retail store won't be permitted. Um, I have received some questions on what constitutes a retail store, so that's something I'm still going to be exploring. And the home occupation um, section of the bylaw does not contain the, it contains this limitation, the definition, and the general provisions. It uh, actually just makes reference to no external um, showcasing of goods. Um, and then a maximum size, and then it has to meet all the other applicable requirements of the bylaw. Oh, my clicker's not working. Lindsay, did I break my clicker? Oh, it's fixed. Um, in addition to those two new kind of sections, uh, we are um, adding some zone requirements. So for yard setbacks, uh, we've kind of amalgamated the agricultural zone requirements with the Hamlet Village residential requirements. Um, we are also going to make it so that the lot frontage and lot area 
are dictated by the um, severance because that's usually when the lot frontage in area is decided is during the severance prof- process. So instead of having a whole bunch of A-1.2 or 4 or 5 um, and adding additional provisions on for lot frontage and lot area, we're, we're just going to say that the lot area and lot frontage is dictated by the severance. And um, that serves as my introduction to this amendment. Um, I just want to stress that these are optional for the municipality to take on. We are definitely interested in feedback, and the planning department has been working with local staff um, to get that feedback and to ensure it works within the local context. We are going to be suggesting these changes to all four lower tiers. So, and at the end of the day, um, the goal of the surplus farm dwelling severance policies is always going to be the protection of farmland and agricultural land. So uh, I just wanted to end on that note, and I'm happy to take feedback at this point. All right. Uh, thank you, Planner Gilbert. Um, let's turn to council comments, uh, questions at this point. Councillor Rothwell. Thanks very much, uh, Mayor Todd, and through you, thank you, Jerrica, for your report. Uh, just a, a couple of questions that I have uh, there. Uh, first, on uh, the new definition of home industry, uh, the uh, uh, limitation of two employees, uh, you did mention that uh, people, the expectation is that people living in the dwelling on the farm would be involved. Are these, the limit of two employees, is that in addition to those that are uh, living on the property, uh, or how does that work? No, it's uh, it would just be two employees. So it can involve people who live on the property, and it can be people who are off the property as well. Okay, just uh, so we're clear, like the current uh, definition for a secondary farm occupation specifically uh, uh, allows uh, two off, or I think it, if it's still the same, uh, up to two off-farm employees, and there was no limit on the total number of employees. So just for clarification, and just so everyone knows, I think that might be a, a clarification point. Uh, the second point uh, dealing with home industries, uh, the 450 square meters, is that uh, larger than what's currently permitted as a secondary farm occupation? Uh, I will have to double check that for you. I believe it, I think the existing might be 425 now that you mention it, but I, it's in that ballpark. Um, but yes, my, my apologies for not knowing the number offhand. That's okay. My, my concern is, and I believe this council uh, shared the concern, is, is the size of a home industry on a, a surplus farm, uh, a lot that's been created through the surplus farm uh, residence policies, uh, shouldn't, shouldn't necessarily uh, be of uh, a significant size or, or permitted at all. I think those were some of the comments that we had previously. Uh, I, I am concerned uh, of all the previous uh, surplus farmhouse severance pol um, applications that we've had, where there's a specific exclusion uh, for uh, secondary farm occupations as they were uh, currently known. Uh, so I, I am uh, concerned about uh, you know the new the new uh, uh, inclusion of that. Uh, and the last piece, uh, if I may, Mr. Mayor, is dealing with uh, the comment about uh, the MDS uh, calculations. Uh, for uh, the non-commercial uh, keeping of livestock. Uh, the provisions say that the MDS requirements uh, uh, should be met. I think uh, if you can check uh, with the documentation here, I believe the current uh, definitions uh, uh, that we have in, in the zone, in the agricultural zone, as well as from the MDS, the, in the agricultural zone, it's the greater of 30 meters or whatever the MDS calculation distance is. And I would suggest that uh, there will be next to no uh, lives, uh, non-commercial livestock facilities that would be on a severed lot that would be able to meet uh, a minimum of 30 meters uh, for a front side or rear yard. So just, you know, my reading of, of what the information is, if you could just clarify that uh, going forward, I'd appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rothwell. Anyone else? Uh, Councillor Nordham? Uh, through you, Mary Todd. Uh, thanks for your report, Jessica. Uh, just curious, would it be um, the bylaw officers that would be um, looking how many animals people were, were having on their property 
and um, also, I, yeah, I can perceive quite a bit of uh, when people have 20 chickens or so that uh, there will be quite a bit of uh, trying to sell eggs and whatnot. Um, will there be some education on uh, that people can't do that? It would definitely come up if we were um, discussing the bylaw requirements with um, property owners if they came to us. Um, I, I was speaking with the bylaw enforcement officer uh, today regarding the feasibility of how easy this will be to enforce. Um, I don't have an easy answer for that because unfortunately, like, two nutrient units, but then also kind of this, um, this idea of, like, it being accessory to the residential use. And is 20 chickens, un like, is that, yeah. is that enough for a residence? It might be if you got 13 kids or something, but um, it's definitely not 300 chickens, no. definitely not 50 chickens. Um, but, yeah, that, that aspect is definitely something to consider. Yeah, that's good. Okay, I'm, I'm interested if I might ask a question and I just want to see if I'm following where Council Rothwell was going. Um, it interests me that, that perhaps in the past uh, we were more restrictive and, um, and now we're saying um, a whole bunch of people who had those applications in over the last four or five years that the, the, the process has been available to them um, may have been um, affected negatively uh, by our policy, and now we're changing it. And I just want to sort of get a sense of, of if you have any sense of the scope of that. Like, are there, is, is this a realistic concern? And how many uh, of the severances that have been done by the County of Perth may have wanted to do what what is sort of proposed here, but weren't allowed to in the moment? That's a difficult question to answer. Um, I only have anecdotal evidence as working as a planner. I know some residents have been deterred from seeking surplus farm dwelling severances. Um, the few in my cases always concerned horses. Um, they wanted to keep their barns on the property for their, um, like, one or two ponies. Um, that being said, uh, I do think there is something to say for thinking forward. Obviously, we do have to think about um, where we've been and how uh, some measure of fairness. But um, I think a lot of municipalities have been dealing with surplus farm dwelling severances and trying to navigate that territory um, since it's only been recently enabled by the provincial policy statement, um, which is why we're trying to bring this forward to get some clarification so that um, our residents kind of understand like what the expectations are for this lot and not make them to the point where there's only a certain type of person that may be able to benefit from a surplus farm dwelling lot. Um, but definitely there's a lot, there's a lot going on here for sure. Okay, thank you. I didn't mean to make you squirm. I, I was oh. <laughs> trying to trying to, to understand, you know, what, what the impacts might be and who might be knocking on our door saying you treated me without good reason a few years ago. Councillor Duncan, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mayor Kaysenberg. Uh, I'm generally supportive of both of these zoning bylaw amendments. My only concern maybe would maybe be the size of the the operation at 450 square meters. I wonder if that maybe should be decreased a little bit um, in size. That's maybe my concern with that. Thank you. Okay, you'll take note of that. Yes, yes, thank All right. you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Rothwell, one more crack at this. Yeah, thanks very much, Mayor Todd, not to uh, go on too much further, but, but uh, to follow up on uh, Councillor Nordham's uh, comment, two nutrient units doesn't sound like a whole lot until you start actually looking at what a nutrient unit actually comprised of. So using poultry, chicken laying hens specifically, okay. it's 150 laying hens equals one nutrient unit. So under these provisions, you could have up to uh, 
299 or 300, depending it's two units or less, I guess, uh, 300 laying hens. And frankly, the, the point of non-commercial is uh, maybe fair uh, to, to deal with that, but uh, I, would, I would suggest it's unlikely that uh, any uh, family living in one of these residents uh, would need to have 300 laying hens like from a non-commercial. So I'm just like two, two nutrient units is a, is a fine number to look at if you're looking at, for example, two horses or, or something like that. But uh, when we're actually talking chickens or pigs or something, the numbers are much more substantial than, than what you would at first think. That's my comment. So. Okay, thanks. Um, did you have any feedback, or are you just taking note of that point? Uh, no, it, it is definitely something that I've um, been considering. I actually went through the MDS um, table and calculated two nutrient units. Um, there's also a lot of animals on there I didn't think we'd have nutrient units for, um, like al alpacas and emus and all this other stuff. Um, it is definitely... A concern. I think the approach that we're seeing with the planning department is the reasonability. So the whole kind of concept of accessory, and perhaps we should make that more apparent with the two nutrient units. That's not just two nutrient units, but it's two nutrient units in relationship to what's accessory for the animal in question. I just don't have the wording for it yet. Thanks, Mary Todd. I appreciate, uh, Jerrica, the, the struggle that, uh, that you've got on that, and it's a, a tough one. I, I would say, generally speaking, if, if a limit is, is two, for example, people will go to the two. Hopefully they don't go above, but hope they would probably go to the two as opposed to going uh, less. And the last point from a helpful standpoint is that in the provisions, uh, yeah, the uh, dwelling uh, as well as one accessory, dwelling is specifically permitted. I think the provisions uh, the province has imposed uh, dealing with Bill 23 is going to be up to two additional you know, So just uh, we may see a revision in that depending on the planning department, how they're going to read the uh, Bill 23 provisions and whether they're limited to one additional dwelling unit or whether it's up to two additional. So in regards to Bill 23, um, the secondary dwelling unit policies in the agricultural areas are actually dictated by the official plan and zoning bylaw. The as of right um, zoning provisions enabled by Bill 23 uh, only affect urban residential areas, and a large part of that um, has to do with servicing. Just, just further on that point, I appreciate this, Mayor, uh, is that we did have a presentation by uh, uh, Sally McMillan, and the question was specifically came forward on that. So just, uh, I don't want to get into a debate about it, but just if you can have that conversation again, mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm quite happy with the answer I'm hearing from you on this. I am uh, concerned about the uh, other answer that we had, and as was uh, uh, Ms. McMillan, is that uh, servicing is a critical issue, and if we're going to allow uh, up to three units on a, on a sewage system, which is uh, already existing, without truly looking at that maximum capacity, I think that's a big issue. So anyways, if you can have that uh, conversation, I'd appreciate that. Thank you. Yes. Okay, we've, we've kind of, you know, drilled around in the, some of the details of the, the text, the proposed um, uh, resolution or the, the proposed changes here to the zoning uh, bylaw. Um, in fact, uh, the resolution that uh, is proposed to us is about putting this out to the public for public consultation. So um, I'm sure that, um, that um, Planner Gilbert will record many of the comments that we've made because they act as public inputs. Um, to uh, the, the, the scope and nature of the policy um, and the bylaw amendment. But <clears throat> at this time, um, I have a resolution, if Council is willing to consider it, which relates to uh, the public consultation piece. And it's as follows. The Council directs staff to circulate a notice of public meeting for the proposed housekeeping zoning amendment to amend the zoning provisions related to surplus farm severances in the North Perth zoning bylaw. Councillor Richardson had his hand up as mover. Deputy Mayor Callum will serve as seconder on this one. Thank you. Um, and do we have any discussion, further discussion or debate on on that action? Let's let's keep it fairly narrow here. Councillor Rothwell. Thanks, Mayor Todd. Uh, I appreciate the desire to move forward uh, with this uh, to get public input and so on. I, I would appreciate uh, 
a slight delay in moving forward until such time as we've heard some information from the planning department regarding uh, some of the matters that we've brought forward, uh, specifically the, the size of the uh, uh, proposed uh, home industry as to whether or not that uh, number is considered to be appropriate or not, uh, as well as uh, clarification with respect to some issues about the MDS and uh, number of employees and so on. So I would appreciate if, if we could uh, have a uh, pause uh, to get information back before we would put that out to the public. That's my comment. Thank okay, you. That's, it sounds like the scope of an amendment. So you, you want to move an amendment here mm -hmm. that uh, indicates that this council would like a further report in response to the topics discussed during this session um, before it consents to uh, directing the staff for the future actions? I, I would appreciate that, uh, whether the rest of council is, is of that opinion. Uh, but uh, I, I would be hopeful that staff would be able to turn this around in relatively short order uh, so that we could have that least uh, understanding at the council table before it goes out to the public. Okay, so um, I'm going to consider that, that you've moved an amendment unless you tell me otherwise. Uh, I, I still move an amendment to the right. motion, yes. All right, and uh, let's see if there's a seconder around the table. Someone wishes to second that. Councillor Blazek will second that. Okay, so we have an amendment that changes the, the resolution materially and that says that we would appreciate, uh, we, we're going to direct staff to return a report on the topics and themes discussed by council on this matter, on the matter of the zoning bylaw amendment, and uh, that we will consider at a future date direction to staff related to public meeting, uh, notice of public meeting for this housekeeping amendment. The clerk is looking a little bit puzzled about this. Do you think we should try? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, just that amendment to the main motion as the main motion is that staff move forward with the with the public consultation so it would be easier to withdraw the main motion and then move that as an alternative motion alternately you could make an amendment specifying timelines when you want to move forward with the public consultation it's just a little contradictory okay it, it strikes me in, in listening to the comments that um, council's wish is, and maybe I need to test this, wish is to hear the answers and some further input before it, it considers granting movement towards a public meeting. Is that generally fair? I see Councillor Blazek nodding her head. Councillor Rothwell, I think that's your position, right? Um, others... Do you want to consider it that way? I mean, we can get our parliamentary procedure straightened out here if we need to. Um, Deputy Mayor Callum? Yes, the three Mayor Case. I, do, I don't understand why we can't uh, uh, proceed with the, the motion that was on the table and then just ask for direction to not bring it to the public and bring back information before. Like, there's, it's, there's not a date on here that says we're going directly to a public meeting. Pass the original motion, and then you come back with the concerns that some uh, colleagues had around the table. Would that work? Um, sure. Sorry. Gilbert, go ahead. Sorry, through you, Mayor. And I just want to emphasize, like, this is municipality initiated, so there's no planning timeline. Like, we're not going to be... Um, pressured or into making a decision or having this come back, I should be able to get your issues, um, like I should be able to get it to you soon, and I, it, any of these options are fine for me. Okay. Um, procedurally, I think uh, the clerk raises an important point, though, and, uh, and that we're kind of, we have at this point uh, an amendment on the floor which actually kind of unravels the original motion. Um, so that's probably not a good place to be. We should be more clear about this. Um, in terms of, of actual proceeding, uh, I think that the, the right approach is to probably remove the amendment first if there's consent from the mover and seconder. And then uh, we decide whether we want to consider the motion as it stands or whether we want to, to remove that one and then introduce an alternative. So... Um, let's proceed along that somewhat convoluted but probably correct path from a parliamentary procedure perspective. Councillor Rothwell, are you willing to see this move forward in that way? Uh, through you, uh, Mayor, it's 
thought. Yeah, I'm willing to uh, withdraw the uh, uh, suggested revision uh, to the motion uh, on the basis of the discussion points is that we will see a report uh, that would go forward prior to the actual uh, information going to, uh, being uh, notified to the public. I, I just want to make sure that there's an understanding is that we don't go to the public with exactly what we've got here before we have the information discussed at this council and any amendments that are required to satisfy this council. That, On that basis, I'm willing to certainly withdraw the motion if my seconder is as well. Okay, the clerk is looking at me, so let's uh, have it. I uh, do, Mr. Mayor. I just have a suggestion on, on maybe the proposed wording. So if we want to remove the motion that's on the floor, we could potentially, council could move a motion that states something like, that council directs staff to uh, report back um, addressing comments heard regarding the proposed draft housekeeping zoning amendment prior to circulating a notice of public meeting for the proposed housekeeping zoning amendment. Um, just further to the wording that's in Planner Gilbert's report. I, I think that's the one. Yeah, I think that's where we're going. So. You know, we're, we're, we just need to do this properly. You're going to withdraw. Yes. You're good with withdrawing. Okay, then it was uh, Councillor Richardson moved the original. You're going to withdraw? Or was it Deputy Mayor? You moved. You second. And you'll withdraw? Okay, so uh, we have consent from the movers and seconders of, of both the primary motion and the secondary motion to collapse it all and take it off the floor. Now let's do what Ms. Klein said. It sounded like it was the right strategy, which is that council directs staff to return a report on the topics and themes that were discussed by council during this session of council, uh, and uh, to do that prior to any direction to um, circulate a notice of public meeting. Does that sound about right to you? You can finesse it. Does that sound, uh, uh, Jerrica, is that all right? Oh, yeah. No, okay. But I yeah. wasn't sure if you were waving at Clerk Klein or, you know. All right, uh, that gets us somewhere. Uh, Councillor Richardson, you're waving your hand. You want to move this? I can move the same, the amended one, sure. I this is the, the new motion that we put on the floor. Yeah, okay. As, okay, so that's moved. Seconder will be Councillor Blazek. Thank you. Um, all right, we have greater clarity now. We have one motion to consider. Any further discussion or debate? That was fun. All right, uh, let's have that vote. <laughs> okay. And the scribe went to sleep for some people, perhaps, and that is carried. Thank you. Like I said, that was fun. Sometimes parliamentary procedure requires uh, more of us than we would think is reasonable, but um, there we go. We got there. <laughs> All right, um, and uh, we acknowledge then that um, Councillor Andreessen has returned to the chamber. That brings us to item six. Um, Planner Gilbert, thank you. Whatever. We appreciate the, the clarity and the fact that you'll have some homework and bring it back to us. Um, let's go to item six on our agenda. Uh, for item 6.1, councillors, are there any reports you would like to ask of staff of, or of our committees? Councillor Duncan, let's start with you. Um, I'd like to request a report from the Public Works Department on how many hours were spent on rural road maintenance in 2022. Okay. Um, do we have, uh, let's just turn to staff for a moment. Uh, CEO Snell, um, what's your impression about uh, whether this can be answered immediately or whether we uh, proceed to a more detailed uh, effort? Certainly, I would need to get Linda to provide some more detail. I just want to make sure that includes um, gravel and calcium. Gravel, calcium, grading. Yeah. And would it include the, any of the rural, rural construction? No, just maintenance. Okay, please. perfect. Thank you. Maintenance. Okay. So we have um, a request from Councillor Duncan, which warrants a oh. resolution uh, to direct staff to bring forward a report uh, on rural Road maintenance. road maintenance, including the factors that CAO Snell clarified uh, in his questions uh, for clarification. Uh, moved by Councillor Duncan. Who will be the seconder in this one? Councillor Andreessen, thank you. Any discussion or debate? 
Uh, Councillor Johnston. Just wondering, Chris, if we can get some historical data, whether the hours were up or down over the last couple of years as well. That might also be very helpful. What I heard is we can try. That's what I heard. That's what I heard. All right. Uh, so we'll see what staff brings back. But, okay, we have a resolution on the floor that's been duly moved and seconded. Um, any further discussion or debate? Uh, the CAO is now. summer maintenance okay so the request is excluding winter maintenance okay all right any other questions or comments on the resolution let's have a vote on that the scribe is acting up here there we go And that is carried. Thank you. Um, any other business under item 6.1 for requests for reports? Seeing none, let's move along to item 7 then. Uh, we have no items uh, additional uh, uh, to our correspondence that was already seen in the uh, consent agenda. So that allows us to move on to item 8. Uh, we do not have any additional bylaws to consider at this evening's meeting. Uh, we're now at item 9 on our agenda. Are there any councillors wishing leave to give notice of motion tonight? Seeing none, let's move to item 10 on our agenda. For item 10.1, are there any announcements that would be of benefit to our community or that reflect well on North Perth at this time? And uh, certainly, uh, Councillor Anstead still with us. If he wants to uh, join us, just wave your hands or something. We'll, we'll be happy to hear from you, too. Anyone have an announcement? We have general good vibes from Patty Fest. Um, I think all of us uh, had some exposure to the event and it uh, seemed like it was uh, enjoyed by the community. I, I haven't heard a final report on um, facility impacts. Uh, were there anything, was there anything noteworthy with regards to facility impacts, CEO Snow? All the reports I heard, things went very well over the Patty Fest, and there was certainly um, no facility impacts I'm aware of. Yes, I think it was very positive from what I could see. Uh, very good. All right, uh, let's move on then to agenda item number 11. Uh, we don't have any matters to consider in a closed session meeting of council this evening. That means that for item 12, we have nothing to report back out on to the public. Um, that means that we've come to the consent agenda, uh, or sorry, the confirmation bylaw point. And uh, I think Councillor Andreessen needs to absent herself from the room for this. Uh, I have the uh, draft of a confirmatory um, bylaw for our consideration as follows at bylaw number 28 2023. Being a bylaw to confirm generally previous actions of the Council of the Municipality of North Perth be introduced, read, and considered read a first second and third time and be finally passed and the said bylaw be signed by the mayor and the clerk and sealed with the seal of the corporation. Moved by Deputy Mayor Kellum, seconded by Councillor Nordham. Any discussion or debate? Seeing none, let's have that vote. And that is carried. And that means, councillors, that we have completed the deliberations and taken action on the business that did come before us tonight. It is therefore appropriate for us to consider a resolution for adjournment. I have one as follows. The council meeting adjourns at 9.24 p.m. to meet again for general council business on Monday, April 3rd, 2023 at 7 p.m. Can I call for a mover on this? Councillor Rothwell and Councillor Johnston, the, the boys from Britain. Um, that's not a debatable motion, so let's have that vote.
and that is carried. Uh, council, I point out that our uh, while our next regular council meeting is Monday, April 3rd, we do have a budget committee meeting on capital and projects this Wednesday at 7 p.m. Until those dates, though, this meeting is adjourned.